All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out to my talk, Cooperative Economics for Engineers, or the subtitle, Why You Have More in Common with Pirate Fleets Than with Your Manager, which, by the way, my manager absolutely loved that title. Uh, just as a content warning, uh, this talk is going to include some discussions of violence, slavery, and racism. It also has some historical document photos, so if you're going to have a problem with that, now would be a great time to walk out. Uh, I'm not going to be taking questions. Instead, I'm going to do an open space afterwards. Um, so uh, I'll also be uh, tweeting the links and slides. Uh, my Twitter handle is on the slides themselves. Uh, also, I believe this is being recorded, so uh, if there's video, it'll be up later. Final set of bookkeeping, uh, so I work in finance, I have to have these disclaimers. Please do not take investment advice from a presentation about pirates. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm James, I'm a senior SRE at Quantopian. Uh, in the finance space, I do a lot of work with Python, but this talk's not really about what I do at work. Um, this talk's actually about labor. And before I start talking about labor, I want to ask a quick question. Who has a laptop with stickers on it that looks like this? OK, that's like a pretty sizable number. Uh, raise your hand really high if you have stickers like this, and one of them is a union sticker. I don't see a single hand in the audience. And why is that? Um, because if you go look at a construction site, right, on their hard hats, they do the same sticker sort of thing, but most of them are union stickers. It's pretty standard. You'd be surprised if you didn't see one. But in 2019, uh, tech was at a place where... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What am I blocking? You want to make sure you have the best oh, talk. Okay. Sorry. Um... It right. doesn't seem to be, but I'll move it up there. All right. Um, so uh, in 2019, almost no uh, tech workers like are part of a union or identify as part of organized labor uh, or really have any like ownership or stake in their companies. Um, but that actually really started to change in 2019. People started to take a serious interest in this. We saw a lot of uh, walkouts from uh, game companies at Google. Um, actually, at Google, they had to have the uh, NLRB step in and say, hey, you can't tell your employees to stop talking about unions at work. They have a right to do this. Um, and sometimes that retaliation got pretty aggressive. NPM had this situation where uh, some employees were trying to form a union and they were retaliated against. And that actually led to not just those employees, but also a lot of other employees who weren't part of the initial effort leaving because they didn't like to see that retaliation. Uh, we're also seeing this in some areas adjacent to tech. So, of course, uh, a lot of folks here would identify as engineers or people who are writing code, but it's also people who work at more new media establishments, uh, so tech adjacent. Uh, some of them have started unionizing. Uh-oh. Did I lose slides? And I think I'm at a lost internet here. Uh, I should have done an export first. Well, I will make do. So uh, it's also spilled over into um, sort of popular society, where uh, this was really when we started to see a lot of backlash against big tech, against the working conditions at those companies, and against the contracts that they're taking on. So Cambridge Analytica, Clearview AI, um, what Palantir has been doing, uh, oh. Yeah, uh, what Palantir has been uh, doing, working with uh, ICE directly, um, as well as the support that Amazon has been providing for these companies. These are all things that really made the news that a lot of people are talking about. So really the state of 2019, the way it ended was that everyone's angry at tech, uh, even people in tech are angry at tech at this point. But the question is, what are people in tech actually going to do about that? Because to my mind, if we just all started adding union stickers to our laptops and called it a day, that wouldn't be much of a change, would it? We already have pretty well-paying jobs, pretty steady employments. Um, so for me, I'm a lot more interested in what can tech do about uh, larger scale problems, the way that we interface with society. Uh, and I think we'll have to be a little more creative for that. And when I think creativity, where I like to learn my lessons from, one of the major places that I do is actually uh, history. So I could start here with this guy, because you know, organized labor, that sounds Marxist. But 
I actually want to start about a thousand years uh, before him, or 10 minutes from now. So we're actually going to start in the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, this is a time after the fall of the Roman Empire. This is a time with a lot of chaos and disruption, and people are looking for stability. So they start to invent this new social order that we call feudalism. Uh, and people uh, in this social order, it's got a king on top, nobles underneath that, uh, knights to help enforce that rule, uh, and peasants at the bottom. And some of these peasants are called serfs. They're actually bought and sold with the land. They're sort of like a form of slavery. Um, Oh. We're going to represent it, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. So um, these serfs are, uh, you know, the lowest of the low. But not every peasant is like that. Some of these peasants are actually skilled craftspeople. Um, and as the Middle Ages go on, they start to be really successful. They start making a lot of money. And they become what's effectively the middle class of that era. Um, they would become members of guilds. And in modern terms, a guild would be essentially a union shop. Uh, you, have, uh, you have a group of folks uh, who are um, pulling their resources together, uh, who are training each other, often from a young age. So you might have gotten started in your guild at 12 or 14 years old. Um, and these guilds are local institutions because they don't just provide on-the-job training, they're also providing benefits. They're making sure that you have like a minimum set of compensation, they're making sure that you, uh, your family gets taken care of if you get sick. Can we uh, just leave this with uh, the bar there? I got, I got you there. Now we're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's better. Thank you. Um, so uh, these guilds craftspeople, they're working together on these collaborations. Um, and uh, they're producing higher quality goods. So it's actually a really successful system. It's really stable. And when you're producing higher quality goods, you want to be able to trade using the mark of that guild. So you mark your goods as being from a particular guild. And you can only do that um, if they're high enough quality. How do they enforce that, though? Because this is really early in history, so it's actually before we had modern court systems, modern police. And the answer is that people in a guild would self-police. They would actually inspect each other's goods, make sure it was high enough quality. The rest of your guild would actually force you to offer rebates for inferior quality goods. So it was a self-reinforcing system. We saw something similar with the advent of trade. So as we started seeing more specialization of production, we saw goods going longer distances. And when your goods are trading 1,000 miles from where you are, that's a high potential that you're going to get ripped off, right? So these merchants are actually, at the same time the guilds are running, they're inventing uh, a really cool technology that actually is going to drive modern capitalism. When I say invention, you might think something like, oh, a new shipping technology, right? It's actually contract law. See, merchants invented contract law to deal with this situation. And again, this was before we had the modern court system. This was before we even had modern nations. And what they came up with was a peer-judged system. So it would be merchants trying the cases of other merchants ripping off merchants. So it was a very self-enclosed system. Uh oh. So. We're coming to the end of the Middle Ages, and we have these two stable systems that allow a lot of like, essentially middle class people to have worker-owned and operated lines of business. Um, so what starts to change that we don't really have that much of that today? Well, one of the really big factors is the spread of colonialism. Uh, so as you start to have more trade, uh, people want a slice of that pie, right? So you start to see more borders, you start to see more expansion and centralization, you see the rise of nationalism through this era. Um, and all that starts to centralize control under governments. Uh, so a lot of people are pretty unhappy with this, right? This directly leads to uh, the modern forms of racism and exploitation, uh, the modern forms of colonialism. So what a lot of people do is they say, fuck it, and become a pirate. <laughs> See, a lot of pirates actually started out as merchants. Uh, you've got to have a ship to be a pirate, right? And who has just a ship lying around? It's mostly merchants. We also had pirates who were deserters from armies. We had pirates who were escaped slaves, because this was the height of slavery this era. Um, we had pirates who were queer and fleeing their communities. 
So it was actually a really, really diverse environment on pirate ships in this era. Uh, and it was called the golden age of piracy in this era. Um, it was really a major trend. So uh, how did these pirates actually all get along if they were all so diverse from a bunch of different backgrounds, uh, cramped up on a ship together for months with lots of swords and guns around? Like, how did they not just kill each other? Well, um, they had this cool technology called contract law. Uh, pirates would actually enter into uh, agreements with each other, and this is all based on the same sort of agreements that merchant ships would have. This is an actual uh, like merchant ship uh, articles of agreement, and it specifies what your salary is going to be, where you're going to work, when you're going to go to port. Um, just as an aside, uh, if you read this one closely, it is actually going to Providence, uh, and the prior destination is the coast of Africa. So this is a slave ship manifest. Uh, that's a lot of what these pirates were raiding in this era. Um, so uh, these pirates, um, they need to have this agreement, and they form this pirate code based on this earlier set of merchant shipping agreements. And as it turns out, these pirates are basically independent contractors, right? They can join whatever ship they want, they bring their own gear to it, they stay on for as long as they want to, uh, and then they leave. Um, so it actually has a lot of parallels to the modern set of independent contractors that we have. So what are the benefits of pirates, uh, of this contracting situation? Well, the benefits of the job were actually pretty good. Um, when you were a pirate crew, you didn't just get paid your salary, so to speak. You had bonuses every time you got a big share of treasure. And those bonuses were really flat. You can see those numbers here. Yeah, the captain's getting like about twice as much, but not 200 times as much, 2,000 times as much. All the pirates also had a vote. So you could vote on what ship you wanted to attack, what port you wanted to go to. Um, so that actually made it a very democratic tradition for the time. Pirates also had disability insurance, uh, which is uh, something that a lot of people wouldn't expect. Uh, this is why we see so many peg legs and eye patches in pirate art, right? Like, if you got wounded, they couldn't just dump you in the ocean. They had to at least let you stick around until you hit port. Also, some pirates had some pretty strong HR policies. So we can compare this with modern independent contractors, right? Um, there's nothing actually wrong with being an independent contractor. Pirates were, and they had it pretty good. What's really wrong is uh, what are those independent contractors uh, getting offered? Uh, what's the equality there? Uh, and what are they being represented as? Because in the case of something like Lyft or Uber, they don't have nearly as many uh, free choices as something like a pirate would. They don't really get an equal share in running the business. They don't get to vote in the same way. So to call them independent contractors is a, definitely a misnomer, as California has uh, decided. So at the end of this era, uh, we start hitting the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. So we're actually going to hop back to England. And what I want to talk about is uh, the Luddites. Uh, has anyone ever called anyone like a Luddite before? Because it's, you know, it's an insult saying, oh, you don't know anything about technology. You're scared of technology. Um, the Luddites were really interesting folks. Uh, they were actually skilled weavers and textile workers. Uh, they would have been the same kind of people in medieval guilds. And they didn't uh, misunderstand technology. They actually understood technology really well. Because the technology they were afraid of was this. It's a computer. Well, it's not really a computer, it's a loom, but uh, it's the predecessor to the first computer, which was never built, the analytical engine. It's what Ada Lovelace wrote the first computer program for. Because at this time, looms were getting so sophisticated they could actually just do arbitrary computation. Uh, they could really turn projects around very fast. Uh, and the Luddites saw this, and they realized what would happen. They weren't actually afraid of a machine taking their jobs. They were afraid of the person who owned the machine taking their jobs. Because it wasn't owned by the community, it was owned by a private industrialist. So when these industrialists came to cities and started forcing people out of their jobs, the Luddites started smashing the machines. So these machines were known as stocking frames, uh, so these uh, Luddites became frame breakers. And it was very fast that the factory owners started retaliating. So sometimes they would just shoot the uh, Luddites coming in and smashing their machines. They would do it personally. But they actually really started uh, lobbying the government to do something about this. The one I have here is a 200-pound reward. Uh, that was early on. Towards the later era, it actually became a capital offense to smash one of these things. Uh, they would basically try you the same way you would for treason. So why is that? Well. 
How many of you know about computer crimes legislation? If you've heard the story of Kevin Mitnick essentially getting like banned from using the internet because of being a hacker, uh, DMCA takedowns, uh, everything with like the DCSS uh, decryption stuff. Um, we see these wildly disproportionate responses against technological crimes that to some actually seem almost victimless. That's because uh, at that era, uh, computers and the internet were seen as a major economic force. And that was actually true in Britain at the time for the textile industry. It was the most important part of the economy. So if we look at something like what happened last year, uh, taking down the, uh, some of the chef packages in response to their ongoing contract with ICE, well, you could see that as essentially a form of industrial sabotage, right? And the history of that has actually been that there's been wildly disproportionate punishment because it's seen as critical to the economic success of some nation. So it's actually really interesting historically that this isn't something you can get in trouble for revoking some license. Um, that that's actually a pretty new development and it's really unprecedented historically. Um, and I'd actually say we shouldn't expect it to continue. I think that Within 10 years, we might see a world where if you did something disruptive to a cloud system or to an AI system, that it could be seen as warranting a very harsh penalty. Now, as we get to the end of the Industrial Revolution and more towards the modern era, um, we enter the often misunderstood Karl Marx. Uh, this is the era that he's starting to write in. And uh, during the time, um, there were a lot of people who identified as Marxists or socialists or communists. The most successful of them uh, would have been in the United States, trade unionists. That's where that tradition really came out of. Um, and when people think unions, they think uh, often of what a modern union looks like. And I'll tell you, modern unions generally don't have to deal with bayonets like these folks are having to deal with. You'll also notice that everyone on the right half of the photo is black, and the folks on the left half of the photo are mostly white. Uh, so there's a very strong racial component here, too. Um, really, unions were actually illegal for a lot of their history. You had to fight very hard to be recognized, uh, often against violence. Sometimes that violence even came at the hands of the US military. But ultimately, unions actually won. Um, so they won the eight-hour workday, they won the five-day work week, they won a lot of child labor laws. So they still have some positive connotations for a lot of people today, even if they're not as strong a force. But there are also some really negative connotations for unions for some people. Um, so this is actually a historical uh, advertisement. Uh, it came from a union. Uh, it's actually advertising essentially uh, anti-Asian racism because the unions were in favor of that at the time. So unions also were against women entering the workforce. Uh, they were against training new employees with the worry it would drive down prices. So whereas unions have accomplished a lot, they also have some pretty bad history to them in some ways. And it was that history that really led to um, uh, unions decreasing in membership. So they had a peak uh, during the last century, but nowadays they're not nearly as strong or, or as commonplace as they used to be for a variety of reasons. And it was during this time, towards uh, the beginning of the 90s and onwards, we start to see a new trend, something different really coalescing power, and that's software. You can actually argue that one of the reasons software was able to become so successful is because they were able to avoid their employees ever unionizing from the start. And that was actually a very conscious move on their part. This still is from an Amazon video. They actually hire anti-union training consultants to try and prevent unions from ever forming. So if your business consists of just algorithms and independent contractors with no rights, it's very easy to fire people quickly. It's very easy to do disruptive changes. So that's good for the people who own these companies and pretty bad for almost anyone else. Um, this one actually came out of Wayfair. Uh, so I'm in Boston, which is where Wayfair is. Uh, the so-called Wayfair walkout um, was uh, people discovering that Wayfair was contracting to sell essentially children's beds to ICE uh, detention facilities. So basically stocking furniture at concentration camps. Uh, a lot of Wayfair employees were very unhappy when they found out about this, so they started walking off the job. Uh, and this is the CEO of Wayfair uh, after those events deciding, we only want to hire non-political employees. And there's a lot of companies that are moving that direction. They don't want to see people involved in any union organizing, in any kind of political activism, uh, talking about climate change. 
And it's not strictly because they just disagree with those policies. It's also because they want to not ever have to give up control. They want to have total control over what the business does. But that's not inevitable. And there's some really interesting stuff happening in 2020 that may change some of that. Um, so uh, Kickstarter uh, got in the news last year because some employees had uh, started to unionize. And Kickstarter actually retaliated against them, uh, fired some of those organizers. And this was despite Kickstarter having reincorporated as a public benefit corporation, which is ideally uh, meant to be a little more publicly accountable. And when they got called on it in news articles, they actually doubled down. They started hiring a uh, anti-union set of lawyers to basically maintain a union-free workplace. That sort of thing's actually pretty common in industry. Uh, your employer might actually be retaining the services of someone like that. But they still lost. Um, Kickstarter actually successfully unionized. They won their NLRB uh, election. So uh, people have been calling them the first uh, like full-time, white-collar, essentially programmer union. Um, and there's a lot of folks who are really interested in that. So they've been following that closely, seeing is that something that could be appropriate for my workplace. Now, for me, I'm not actually uh, a strictly pro-union person, right? For me, I actually tend to prefer cooperatives. Uh, this is my house. And uh, I live with a lot of people. We own the, the house. Uh, we actually share all the decision-making together. So uh, seven humans, four cats, two snakes, we're all landlords here. Um, what does a co-op actually mean, right? It means cooperatively owned and cooperatively operated. Uh, basically, you don't have a distinction between who the workers are and who the owners are. Um, and there's some people doing really interesting things with cooperatives in tech, too. Uh, there's actually a startup uh, accelerator that essentially is a co-op itself and only starts other co-ops, so trying to get more people owning parts of their company. There's also this idea of a platform cooperative, and that actually takes it a step further. It's not just the employees at the company who are part of the cooperative, it's actually all the users too. So imagine something like a music streaming service where the engineers building it, the musicians who list their music, and the listeners who are subscribing to that music could all be involved in helping make decisions about the platform. It's very different from the VC model where you actually want as little control as possible, you want to try and extract value, but you don't necessarily want to build a sustainable organization. So I'm not going to tell you that, oh, you should go join a union right now, or you should go form a co-op. But what I am going to tell you is a lot of people are starting to do those things and starting to really take them seriously as an economic alternative. Um, so if you're interested in the work that any of these organizations are doing, I'm going to post a long Twitter thread about some cool resources in this area. Um, but what I'd say is that uh, all of this is rooted in the past, but it's still ongoing in the present. There's still ways to get involved. And I think we're really going to see some forms of labor organizing that aren't unions, aren't cooperatives, aren't things we've ever even thought of before that are really going to be tailored to the needs of tech. So the next time you're on a job and you see someone get fired, you start wondering about what they're going to do for healthcare. think about how different it might have been if they'd had a guild. The next time someone protests an app, uh, think about whether you'd support that if they decided to start smashing your data center. Um, the next time you see someone uh, get fired without cause, think about what would happen if they had a union to defend them. And most of all, the next time you're working on a project and you feel uncomfortable with what it says about society or what it says about your employer, just reach out. Uh, there's a lot of people who are in that dilemma every day, and we can help you find a better job. We can help you find one that aligns with your values. So ultimately, people want to work with people who have strong moral values. So I'm going to leave you with this quote. It's from the uh, sci-fi and fantasy author and also anarchist philosopher Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, she gave this quote at an award ceremony uh, that she was receiving. Um, and that award uh, was actually one where she basically used the speech to protest against what all of her publishers had been doing, partnering with Amazon. So it doesn't say Amazon there, but really this is a quote about technology. Um, and she was standing up because for her, the partnerships were pretty good. She's a top-selling author. But for all the smaller authors, uh, people who aren't as established, it was a very bad deal with Amazon. They were losing a lot of money on it. 
Uh, and I hope that you'll read these words and understand how they might apply to your workplace, uh, how that might help you start thinking about what's in your interest as a worker. How does that relate to what other workers have done in history? So again, thank you all for coming to this. Uh, I will have some slides up. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the DevOps days. Thank you.